everyone. Welcome to India's best known companies. I'm Minnie Menon. Today I'm at the headquarters of one of the oldest business groups of India, Godrej, to tell the story of a company that matches legacy with modernity that's going deep into India while also scripting a very fascinating international story. <laughs> The steel almara and the ubiquitous Godrej lock are not the only products that make Godrej a household name across India. For decades, the company has been matching its wits against the biggest multinationals across businesses. And it has done well. Started by a lawyer turned inventor, Adeshar Godrej, who set up shop making locks in 1897 and went on to make the first of its kind soap using vegetable fat rather than the regular animal fat, the company has evolved rapidly as India changed and it's only fitting that today as India becomes an economic power, this 115-year-old company has been on the forefront of change. Defining a new breed of aggressive Indian multinationals and spreading its wings across 60 countries in its consumer products business. The man behind this new age aggressive avatar of the company has been Chairman Adi Godrej, who joined the business way back in 1963. So what was Godrej like then when Adi Godrej got back armed with a degree from MIT? When I came back after my studies, I was the first management graduate to join the group. I had an engineering background also in my studies at MIT. And that was very interesting because there were no management schools outside the United States in those days. There weren't any in India. And formal management-based running a business didn't exist. So I had the great opportunity of bringing in formal management practices and things like marketing, human resource development, financial controls, and that uh, helped me very considerably in getting the group to grow. Well, I trained throughout the group, and then I joined what was then called Godrej Soaps. We had two companies in those days, Godrej and Boys and Godrej Soaps. And I joined Godrej Soaps, and I took charge of especially the fast-moving consumer goods business in Godrej Soaps. There were other businesses too. And when I joined, Godrej Soaps was making a loss. So I was able to turn it around in the very first year I joined. And then we had a very strong growth story thereafter. So what was the, you know, the, the, the quick pointers that you used to turn around the company? And what was the reason for, for the kind of challenge? Well, mainly management techniques. Getting strong management thought into things like marketing, sales, uh, financial analysis, human resource development. And that paid good dividends, especially the marketing part. While Godrej may have brought in a new management focus and style, it's a testimony to the company's legacy that some of its oldest products, its soaps, have seen such little change over the decades. And all of this helped as the company faced a barrage of new competitors when the economy opened up in 1991. Godrej believes that facing all the competition was easy because they had always done it. When Godrej soaps, our major competitor was the then Hindustan lever. Uh, even in our other businesses, for example, we were competing with people like Kelvinator in the appliance business. We were competing with Remington in typewriters. So we had international, our major competition was global companies, even in those days. So we were very well equipped uh, for competition when uh, globalization started in 1991. But the new era of liberalization also meant that foreign multinationals could pump in a lot more money and technology into the country. And so this period also saw many Indian business groups like Godrich tying up with MNCs like Procter & Gamble and Sara Lee. We had another strong partnership with General Electric in our appliances business. And when uh, the economy opened up in the 1990s, uh, we decided that since earlier we were not allowed to partner foreign companies and our multinational competition were given a much more free hand in India, it might be useful to partner with some great companies in the world in our important businesses so that we might learn from them. And I think both our joint ventures with GE and Procter & Gamble gave us tremendous learning. A uh, lot of people feel that these were not successful joint ventures. 
But though foreign companies in, were interested in partnering a well-known Indian brand, and we were interested in partnering good foreign companies to get their learnings. This happened in great measure. So we learned a lot from, say, our P&G joint venture in terms of marketing, R&D, advertising, uh, supply chain management, etc. It was great learning. It was a great company. With, from GE, we learned particularly on human resource development. They were a great company. They had 360 degree evaluation, a lot of focus on their business, etc. So we picked up a lot. As most companies do in a few years, both of us learned whatever we wanted from each other, and it made sense for us to restructure. And we restructured those joint ventures. The Sara Lee partnership lasted longer. Ultimately, Sara Lee decided to restructure. They wanted to get out of personal and household care. We bought over their share. And I must say that post that joint venture period in the early 90s, we have developed both scale, size, and competence to compete with the best in the world. And since then, we've acquired companies outside. But one criticism that's come your way, uh, Ms. Godri, is the fact that you could have made Synthol far bigger. And perhaps because of the PNG partnership, you lost focus on that brand. And then you had to revisit it and really go after the market space. I mean, would you contend with it? I would agree was... with it to a certain extent. Because during our PNG partnership for some years, PNG was not particularly interested in promoting the Godrej brands that were licensed to the joint venture. Uh, so uh, clearly, even after that, perhaps we have not grown Synthol as much as we should have. But another brand, which had died down during the PNG joint venture days, which we have revived since called Godrej Number no. 1, is the third largest selling soap in the country. And it's the largest selling what we call grade 1 soap in the country. It's growing extremely well, continues to grow very well. And it's much bigger than our Synthol brand today. Mm. So there was, this was a setback. Do you think that five it years was. was a setback? It was. We had another very, a very strong selling soap called Ganga, which had Ganga gel in it, which was doing extremely well when our joint venture started, and PNG relatively ignored it. They couldn't understand uh, 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 an emotional reason for marketing such as we had with Ganga and uh, the brand died out. Mm. So in a sense, do you think uh, you regret that or do you think in hindsight you get, got far more from that uh, so it kind of balances off? Overall, we gained much more from the PNG joint venture than we lost out. And overall, it made us extremely competitive. And uh, so therefore, overall, I feel it was a good period for us. Godrej believes that at the end of the day, the company learned some important lessons, even though it lost some ground in the key brands it had under its banner. But in business, as in life, there are always learnings and surprises. Up next, how the company chanced upon new segments that would transform its fortunes. Godrich Consumer Products has come a long way since the time R.D. Godrich entered the Vikroli headquarters nearly 50 years ago. The company then, Godrich Soaps, was a dominant player in the two brands it had, Godrich No. 1 and Synthol, which despite the ups and downs in a fast-changing business landscape are still among the top players in their segments. But the new aggressive plans that Godrich Consumer Products is working on is not here. But in two areas that have now emerged as the biggest grossers for the company, hair color and home insecticides. Both have interesting stories around them. There's, these are both very important businesses for the Godrej Group. Uh, in hair color, we started the business about 30 odd years ago. Uh, we started from scratch. We became very competitive. Our major product was a powder hair color, which is a very simple product, very low cost. You may, merely mix powder in a sachet or in a bottle with water, you apply it, it costs less than 15% of what the international creme colorants cost. It uh, delivers almost as good results and it was very successful. Uh, it was pioneered by the Japanese, a company called Hoyu Chemical with a brand called Begin. 
Now, we are the largest in powder hair colors in the world. We've overtaken the Japanese about five years ago. Uh, we are also leaders in overall hair color market in about 21 countries in the world, including India and some of our neighboring countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutan. We are leaders in about 14 African countries and about four South American countries. Uh, these, uh, the African businesses and the South American businesses are through acquisitions. So we have a very strong hair color footprint all over the world. It's a very profitable business for us and it's growing very well. The household insecticides business, we got into a little by accident. There was a company called Trans Electra, started by an entrepreneur who had a very strong manager, Mahindran, who is now the managing director of Goodrich Consumer Products. And they had started this business with a brand called Goodnight and another brand called Hit, extremely successful. And Hindustan uh, Lever had almost sealed an acquisition of that company. Then they, had, for some reason, they backed out at the last moment. They came to us, we had a week to decide, otherwise they wanted to have an IPO. We had a week to decide, and uh, we just looked around the market. We didn't know much about the business, but we looked around the market, we felt that the brand was very strong, and we decided to acquire the company. It has done exceedingly well ever since. Today, 43% of your sales come from the, uh, from the A large part product. of it, and we have acquired a very strong company in Indonesia subsequently in household insecticide. Uh, called Megasari, which is adding tremendously to our portfolio. This is a very strong business. We are by far leaders. We have 40 odd percent of the Indian market in household insecticides, growing very well, highly profitable, and uh, it's a good business. We stumbled onto it, but now 20 years later, it's a very, very strong business. What is interesting is that these two businesses form the core of your acquisitions also. Uh, you know, why didn't you go and acquire soap companies? Why did you acquire hair color companies? And what's, let, let's talk about hair color first. What's the rationale for that? Because we have great size, scale, and technology to make our, us competitive in other markets in these two fields. And the Indian market is large. We are very successful in the Indian market. That gives us the technology and the product platform to be very successful elsewhere. In soap, there is not much that would distinguish us from other companies, if, even if we were to acquire them. And <clears throat> in India also, we are not number one in so, but we are number one in hair color, we are number one in household insecticides. So therefore, but we have acquired a Nigerian company which is in the soap business. So we would look at a soap business outside, but these two give us a competitive edge. <laughs> The competitive edge that Godrej enjoys in both these categories has given it a good platform to go in for aggressive acquisitions overseas. So in the new markets, what's the largest strategy? We cater to the bottom of the pyramid. So for example, in Africa, we don't cater much to the white population, although we have started making inroads into the white market, especially in South Africa. We cater to the bottom of the pyramid in most countries, so even our South American businesses do not cater to the top 10% of income earners. Even in India, we are not very strong among the top 5% of income earners in India. But the rest of the market, and in developing countries, that's the big market, that's the growing market. Uh, we are very successful. So if value for money the category that you are targeting because a lot of Indian companies that have been hugely successful we had Amul a couple of weeks back you know a look at a Maruti and and the fact that it has such a huge uh, you know um, chunk of the Indian automobile market is that what is working uh, for yes, Indian companies? very much so because we understand that very well and in India it gives us great leverage because we have 500 million consumers so whenever we get into a new product it's very easy to get people to try it and whenever we have an innovative product we are very successful at it so yes, that helps us. And in the other markets, that's why we have been very successful in acquiring companies where we add our technology, we add our knowledge to their operation, we add our business processes, which we've been very successful in a developing country, and uh, we've achieved great success. Success has also come thanks to some nimble strategizing that has seen Goldrich turn around and make money out of its many acquisitions over the last few years. We have been able to, for example, source the very important raw material for black hair color from our Indian supplier, which has saved them a lot of money. We've been able to add technological innovations, which have done well. We have learned from them. For example, from our South American acquisitions, we have learned on new products in creme colorants, 
which we will introduce very soon in India, in sachets, which is a great innovation. Okay. So in a sense, value for money, does it logically mean that you have to go up the value chain and some of these acquisitions will help you do that? Yes, we will go up the value chain. We are at all levels of the value chain. So whether in our household insecticide business or in our hair color business, we are at all levels of the value chain. But we are much more competitive at the bottom of the pyramid part of the value chain, which is the big market in all the developing countries. And over a period of time, will you be able to get the same scale to the uh, to the higher end? Yes, also? absolutely, absolutely. We think we'll be very competitive because our value for money mindset will add value there too. Uh, a creme colorant doesn't necessarily have to be at $10 a pack as it is sold in most parts of the world. It can be at $3 very profitable. Up next, why the company is looking overseas when it has so much ground to cover in India and what experts make of its new image and ambitions. at the suburban Mumbai headquarters of Goldrich Consumer Products and the calm here when you walk in can be quite misleading. The company has been on an overdrive with acquisitions that have seen it enter new categories and new geographies. After the first acquisition the company did in 2005, there have been 10 more over the last couple of years. Interestingly, this comes at a time when players like Godrej are still trying to figure out the market across categories and regions in India. So why focus elsewhere and not look at one of the world's biggest bazaars? We are not defocusing at all. We continue to grow very rapidly in the Indian market. We are outpacing our competitors in the Indian market. Now our Indian FMCG business works on negative working capital. We need very little capital for the business. Even the new fixed capital we need to put in for new plant, machinery, etc., comes from the increasing working capital. So either we could give out huge dividends to our shareholders or invest some of that money into acquiring businesses outside. And we realize that doing that would add tremendous value, and it has. We are continuing to grow faster in India than we did earlier. There is a limit to what you can grow without disrupting your profitability. You cannot just overnight increase your market share tremendously. You have to compete, grow. So we are doing as well in India as we could, whether we were outside or not. Plus, we are adding these international businesses. And our shareholders have also rewarded it. Let the let stock price a, has gone let up. Let me take a step back. Very few companies in India can boast of that kind of a situation where you have so much of you know, surplus that you need to put it somewhere. Where do you get the cost benefits? How have you worked that out in the back end? Well, most Indian FMCG businesses are able to work on negative working capital because we don't have to supply to modern retailers people do in most parts of the world. And when we supply to small retailers, we get advance payments from our distributors and we get credit from our suppliers. So we work on negative working capital. So capital is no problem whatsoever. So the surplus capital, for the first 10 years of when Godrej Consumer Products was first demerged from Godrej Soap, for the first few years, we did 10 buybacks of shares. We increased our shareholding thereby created a lot of value for the continuing shareholders. Then we realized a much better value creation for our shareholders would be to acquire businesses outside. Because these businesses started getting available about six years ago. And we've made about 11 acquisitions since then. FMCG analyst Sagarika Mukherjee from SBI Caps puts Godrid's acquisition plans in perspective. You know, the two, three things that they usually look at when they sort of look for an acquisition is obviously the valuation shouldn't be insanely high. Uh, two is that, you know, there should be something complementary in terms of distribution or sort of some sort of integration benefits that they can get or it should be some sort of like, you know, manufacturing expertise that they can gain or it could be the product portfolio itself like, you know, uh, the recent acquisition of Darling that they did was to complement uh, the product portfolio that they had uh, in Kinky in Africa basically. So, you know, the two, three things, Kinky was only, you know, sort of covering 
covering uh, Cape Town and the Durban region in South Africa. And, you know, Darling was spread all over. It's massive in sub-Saharan area. So, you know, it was the geography that expanded. Darling was, you know, having a lot of manufacturing expertise. Kinky was importing everything from China. So now they are manufacturing every Kinky product from Darling. So this is where, you know, the cost benefits come in. When you're sourcing more, then you obviously source more efficiently as well. So this is how you see the margins expanding as well. But the acquisitions were part of a larger change in Godrej, a change in strategy through a young, aggressive team. If the team within was thinking differently, the group externally also went for a makeover in 2008 when it went for a massive rebranding exercise that saw the company sport a new look and a new purpose. The rebranding and the attempt to make a brand resonate with the youth has paid off. But marketing expert Kiran Kala from Chlorophyll says a lot more needs to be done. Just to get a sense of what is the potential in that brand name, in that brand, and has that potential genuinely been uh, exploited? It's an old brand, so compare it, say, to a Tata, then I think Tata has been exploited much better than a Godrej. And then you compare it to an even younger group, because I think Godrej is pre, uh, pre-independence, 19th century. And take a slightly older group, uh, like Mahindra, and I ask somebody to look at the figures. I think 10 years ago, uh, both of them had the same market cap. Today, Mahindra is 10 times, I think, the revenue. So at a very, at a very uh, macro level, uh, I feel that brand name hasn't been exploited well. Uh, the trust that it enjoys, the goodwill that it enjoys, the sense of good governance and ethics. Um, I don't think that has been converted into cash. In a sense, what Kalap is saying is a backhanded compliment for Godric and Tom's plan is to make his group 10 times bigger in 10 years. So is Godric targeting to be the next Unilever? We have 500 million consumers who use one or the other of our products. We'd like it to become a billion. Now, how do we do it? How do we add? How do we innovate? And how do we reach out to our consumers? That's extremely important. And the brand has to do that. Sure. You know, uh, what will make Godrej? And, and you, you told me that in 10 years, your target is to be 10 times the size in, in the company. Can Godrej become a Unilever? Well, we don't want to be a Unilever. Unilever still has the bulk of its business in the developed world. Sure. Uh, it has, can, it, can it has a great presence in the developing world. It has a great presence in the developing world. It's perhaps the FMCG company most present in the developing world, but we want to be only in the developing world. The developed world is not growing much. We don't want to add businesses in the developed world, not in consumer products. We want to be in the developing world. So uh, we would like to be more global. We'd like to be more international. We think India is such a large part of the developing world that India will be a large market for us. But we would like to be more multinational than we are today. We are agnostic to what part of our business comes from outside the country or within the country. We wish to grow, as I said, 10 by 10, become 10 times in 10 years. Wherever it comes from. Wherever it comes from. Like many of India's biggest business houses, Godrish today believes the world is a stage. And that is fair because with global economic equations changing, it's only a matter of time before the familiar companies here begin to dominate markets beyond. That's an interesting new turn in a 115-year-old journey.